So on Wednesday nights, we're actually going through the book of Samuel, and we've been learning about first how Samuel was an awesome man of God, how he was trained from the very beginning to serve the Lord, to be a prophet and a judge. He served as a priest. What an interesting character. And then Samuel's heart as he uh, uh, was there to anoint Saul. So when we get to 1 Samuel 16, we see in the first verse, if you look at verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? So we've come to this point now where it's been said, Hey, don't mourn over him. I've rejected him. He's not going to reign. Now, for those of you that weren't with us in the past few weeks, go back to chapter 10. Let me just catch you up on Saul so we can get a glimpse of Saul in chapter 10, if you would. Chapter 10 is where he is anointed as the king. And when you get to chapter 10, find verse number 6. Verse number 6, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee for God is with thee. So when we see the anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon somebody, they become another man. Uh, they get a new heart. They begin to do things that they have not done before. Jump down to verse 9. It says, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. When they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. So we see that Saul is not just anointed as king, but God's Holy Spirit is poured out on him. And he becomes a prophet. Now he's preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the next chapter. Uh, go to the next chapter. There was a major war almost immediately. It was Nahash, the Ammonite, surrounded them. They needed a deliverer. Go to verse 13. We'll see that Saul was that deliverer. And Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Then said Samuel to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. So we see that he's used as the deliverer by the Lord. The people are gathering together. Things are going well with Saul, but uh, you know they say that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we're going to see that Saul begins to have some problems. In the next chapter, chapter 12, look at verse number 6. There's a warning to Saul. And Samuel said unto the people, it is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. It's very important for us to remind the next generation that it's because of the Lord that we have great heroes of the faith in the past and that uh, our, our fathers were brought forth and God has done great deliverances in our families in the past and this warning was given. He's trying to remind the people and Saul, be careful now, uh, Saul, it's not because of you. No, no, no. It was the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron. In the same chapter, look at verse 14. If ye will fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and not rebel. Here's the warning. If you obey and don't rebel. Now, what's interesting with God, when it comes to promises, a lot of times there is this if and then clause or if and but and what does he mean so it's like well to be saved there is a requirement to be saved you must believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved that's his promise uh, if you do not believe on the lord jesus christ then uh, death and hell the lake of fire is what you have to look forward to uh, so we see that god gives this condition when he gives these promises and so he makes it clear if you will fear the lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. So there's the if and then. He says it again in verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then 
shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. So this warning was given directly to Saul. Now, God sees the future. Samuel did not. Samuel was told to teach these things. He did. If you obey and don't rebel, God's going to bless you. If you rebel, God's going to curse you. He's going to put his hand against you. You're going to have a problem. So this warning was given. Look at verse 24. This is very key. 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. Now we sing this as a song. The kids will play it and only fear the Lord. And I won't sing because I don't have a voice for that. They always told me I had a face for radio. I don't, I don't know what that means. Y'all figure it out, right? Uh, but this is so good, it's worthy to be sung. Only fear the Lord. Don't fear man. Don't fear the banks. Don't fear the enemy. Uh, don't fear the Chinese. Don't fear the Russians. None of them. Don't fear the Muslims. Don't fear the Mormons. Only fear the Lord. When we stand before God with a pure heart and we fear the Lord and we walk in that fear of the Lord, then God can use us to do great things for Him. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. We're going to be talking about the heart tonight. Uh, we're in 1 Samuel 16, and I think each chapter has a theme, and I often give it a title. And the title tonight is Dare to be a David. Uh, now I, don't, I think it was Alethea, Sister Alethea, that chose the music tonight. She didn't know that was my title, but apparently she picked Dare to be a Daniel as we sang it earlier. And I want to talk about Dare to be a David, or Dare to have a heart like David, because God loved David. He loved his heart. You know, David was so awesome. Even when Saul was attacking him, did you know that David was praying for Saul? He loved Saul. Talk about loving your enemies as Christ did and praying for those that despitefully use you. David is our example in the Old Testament of that. So as we've been learning about Saul and his rising up and his downfall, in chapter 13, if you look at the next chapter, we see his fall. We see his fall. Look at verse 13. Of course, he did the sacrifice when he shouldn't have. Verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. This is what God is looking for back then. This is what God is looking for today. Every one of the heroes of the faith that God used for a time and a season and a story, it's because their heart was right with God. Salvation is really a matter of the heart. It's not about checking the boxes or showing up or quitting this. It's a matter of the heart. Well, you can tell me whatever you want, but God sees your heart. And if you're trusting on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, His promise is your sins are forgiven, you're saved. That's his guarantee. So we see Saul begins to fall. Then we get in to chapter 14. I just want to get everybody up to speed where we've been over the past few weeks, right? So chapter 14 is where we see a great victory of Jonathan. Uh, look at verse number 6. And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Now this is interesting. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I hope you live up to your name, young man. Uh, we're talking about you here. Now it, it's the son of Saul, but his attitude was this. I don't care how many of the enemy are out there. If God's going with me, we can have victory. Now in this story, Jonathan, him and his armor bearer, he goes and kills about 20 guys or so, but he walked in faith. Then God sends an earthquake and he begins to eradicate and eliminate the enemy. So as God's getting the victory through this, Jonathan's moving the right way. And I love that statement. There is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or save by few. You know, sometimes God does more with a little than he does with a multitude. How many fishes did he have? Two. Two. Two? Which story? He fed how many? Maybe I should ask that. How many did he feed uh, 5,000? There you go. 
Uh, and then he had, what, seven, or, you know, and then he fed 4,000. Sometimes when there's actually less, God can do more because we have a tendency, our human nature, and this is where Saul was slipping. He said, look what I've gotten. Look what I've done. And God says, well, you missed the point. I wanted to get the glory. I think sometimes in our life we're tempted with opportunities to make more money or to gain more stuff. And when we do that, we say, I built this, and I got that, and I set up this, and we've forgotten to give God the glory. And we end up making only this much, whereas if we were content with such things as we had, and we gave God the glory for everything that we had, then God would be more able to work a miracle on our life and just provide supernaturally. I really do believe that God wants us to expect supernatural results. I think He wants us to have great faith. I was talking about it on Sunday where I said uh, that we ought to work like it's all in our hands. And we ought to pray like it's 100% in God's hands. And what does that mean? We work hard. We're diligent for the Lord. And yet, our faith is in Him. If He doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. Our confidence is in the Lord. Now, in 1 Samuel 14, we see that Saul begins to fall. If you would, look at verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged of mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. So now Saul, puffed up in his pride, his son gets a victory, he takes the credit, you get over here and he starts cursing the people. You people don't do anything unless I say so, and we're going to go over here, and I want to get my enemies, I want to defeat my enemies. And he's beginning to lose sight that it's God that's supposed to get the glory, and it's God that provides the victory. The people were distressed. He cursed the people. Saul, although he was a prophet at one time, he was on his downfall right now. As we get into chapter 15, this is where we were at last week. Uh, if you would look at verse 11. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. God said, I'm done. I changed my mind. I regret setting up Saul. He's a problem. He's rebelling against me. In fact, look at verse uh, 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Let me just real quick make an application for that. If God's showing you that there's something in your life you need to do, whether it be to be a blessing to somebody else, or stop a sin that he's working on you, God would rather you obey that than to give a sacrifice. I've seen many churches and preachers over the years that would go, oh, if you, as long as you're tithing, then it's okay. You know, God's gonna, and there's truth. There's a truth. There's a truth to that. That when I trust the Lord with 90%, I say, I can live off 90%. There's a truth to that. But I don't want you to get the idea that as long as I'm tithing, I don't have to deal with that sin that God keeps dealing with. No, no. Look, what's he say? He says, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken to the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. This was the pronunciation. You're a rebel, you reject God, he'll reject you. That's God's promise. So now we catch up in verse in chapter number 16. Of course, by the end of 15, Samuel had to kill Agag, the king, uh, because Saul had failed there. Chapter 16, verse number 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Uh, so God says, Stop crying over Saul. It's over. It's done. I've rejected him. He's out. He says, Fill thine horn with oil and go. 
Now, if you remember, this horn of oil is what he anointed Saul with initially. In the Bible, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. I think he's kind of saying, quit crying, uh, encourage yourself in the Lord, get filled with the Holy Spirit, and get up and go. That's our commandment. Hey, we need to go out and preach the gospel. And we can only do it through the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're commanded in the New Testament, he says, to be filled with the Spirit. How? Uh, Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. Right? Uh, if we read the Bible, if we'll dig into His Word, God can encourage us and motivate us and give us more drive. So this is what he tells Samuel. Fill your horn with oil and go. He says, I will send thee, so I've got a direction for you, I've got a plan, to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. God says, I'm going to send you, and don't worry, I have already provided for all of your needs. I'm going to take care of everything. It's, it's in my hands. Verse 2, and Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. Now listen, Saul had such a, a fear. He was a fear monger. Everybody was afraid of him. He had this bad attitude. He's cursing people, even to the point of almost killing his son in one of the previous chapters. And I just have to say, a, a church should not operate through manipulation. A leader should not be somebody that scares you into obeying them. Uh, we shouldn't be abusive. We shouldn't be narcissistic. We shouldn't be like a psychopath bullying people around. No, no, no. We need to, as David, as we'll see, our heart needs to be tender unto the Lord and loving. This is the type of person that God honors. But Saul, if he hear it, he will kill me. Saul would kill one of the prophets? Well, yes, he'll do that and more, as we'll see. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me, unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? This is kind of interesting. When he shows up in town, everybody's like, Ooh, are you, are you coming peaceably? We're kind of scared of you. We heard what you did with Agag, how you hewed him into pieces. Now this was an older man, a prophet, that apparently took out his sword, and he cut up the leader of the bad guys. And everybody's like, this is the prophet, but boy, he can, when he gets mad, you better be careful. So the people were maybe gun-shy. Maybe they were uh, sort of afraid because of the anger of Saul in the kingdom. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Comest thou peaceably? Verse 5. And he said, peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. You know what sanctify means? It means to be set apart for a holy reason. Uh, this pulpit is sanctified. It is set apart. It is not to be used for a rock and roll show, right? Uh, uh, that offering plate was set apart for a holy reason. It's not to be used to put jelly beans or Legos in there, okay? Uh, the instruments of the house of the Lord, we separate it, we, we clean. And, and God's saying to you, sanctify yourself. Get yourself ready. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He wants to be able to use your vessel. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So Saul's like, That's the guy right there. I can tell already. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. I want to, I want to come back to this in a minute. I want to talk about David's heart. I want to talk about you daring to be a David. Daring to have a heart like one of the greatest men in the Bible. I believe this is God's will for every Christian. Uh, let's continue in the story. We'll come back in a moment. Verse 8, Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. Boy, seven sons. And we still got, that's a lot of kids. 
Did you guys know that 100 years ago, the average family had eight children? And today it's like 2.3. I would hate to be the point three, you know. <laughs> like the old illustration, the short guy comes to the pulpit and he says, I promise I'll be short, you know. <laughs> what's happened to our families? I'll tell you what's happened. It's called women's liberation. It's called birth control. It's called communism and socialism. It's called television and rock and roll and do whatever feels good and you know send mom to work and boy dad he can dad can just you know do whatever he wants and go off and start another family and reject his family. Our, our country is messed up because we've gotten away from the foundation of the family. The family unit is what builds a church. Amen. And that doesn't mean there's not a place for individuals, but I believe God's will is for you, young people, Jonathan. God's will for you is that you would find a Christian woman and get married and stay married and serve God for the rest of your life. If you'll submit to that, the Lord can use you mightily. Amen. Look what he says. We continue in verse 10. And Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. He was a worker. It's interesting how many times God finds a man that's already working, and that's the guy he uses. There are many good examples of that in the Bible. Uh, he says, And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of, anoint, of, of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. He became a new man. He became God's man. I believe when God calls you to the ministry, you stay in the ministry. I believe when God calls you to a purpose, you submit yourself to His will and not your will, and you don't take your hand off the plow. God's Spirit fell upon him, and he prophesied. He became a new man. Now Saul kind of dropped the ball. He kind of fell. And what we're going to see if we continue through this in the few chapters, what happens to Saul's personality and his effectiveness and suddenly the Lord's not answering him because he rejected the Lord and disobeyed the Lord but as far as David his heart here it is his spirit was when the Lord came upon him it stayed upon him from that day forward look at verse 14 but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. This is what happens when you reject the Lord. God will trouble you. Now, I don't believe that a Christian can be possessed. Somebody that's saved. The devil can't just take you captive at his will. But you know what happens a lot of times? Is we, through our covetousness and lust and pride, we just let the devil in. We throw him the keys and say, come on in, because I'm focused on obtaining pleasure. And we forget our calling unto the Lord. And that's what happened with Saul. An evil spirit began to trouble him. Verse 15, And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of his servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now, this is his reputation. This is his good report. Look what he says. That is cunning in playing. That means he has a high level of skill. And a mighty, valiant man. That means he is courageous. You know what David was known for being courageous for? Well, a lion came to attack him and he had nothing with him well, except for God. And by trusting God, he killed the lion. He had a bear come at him and with his bare hands, he killed a bear. Now listen, I mean, maybe one out of 100 men could survive a bear attack with their bare hands. Maybe one out of 100 could survive a lion attack. 
But I'm here to tell you, if your heart is like David's and the Spirit of the Lord is on you, if 10,000 be against you, it doesn't matter because the Lord is with you. Amen. It says he was a mighty, valiant man. He was courageous. It says, and a man of war. You know, we're going to see next chapter, we're going to see David being that man of war while he's still a young man. How is that? Well, he wasn't afraid of the giants. He, as a shepherd that he was known, that he was trained as a shepherd. And a shepherd will lay down their life for the sheep, won't he? He won't run like a hireling when the wolf comes. Oh, no, no, no. The shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep just as the Lord Jesus Christ. And David was ready. He said, here comes a lion, but that's okay. The Lord is with me. Here comes a bear. That's all right. If God's on my side, I have nothing to fear. Oh, a giant? Everybody's afraid of a giant? Not David. He was a man of war. He was a mighty valiant man. Verse 18. And prudent in matters. You know, prudent in matters means he's wise in business. He's frugal with money. He handles situations the right way. Now listen, we as Christians, it ought to be said that when there's problems and trials and tribulations, that because we go to the Lord first, that we handle our matters properly and correctly. That when, oh no, it's all going wrong, we can stand firm and say, hey, it's all right. There's an opportunity here. Let's find the blessing in this. Let's search for God's will so that we can get the, so that He can get the glory and we can learn how to help somebody else in this hard time. He was prudent in matters and a comely person. He was good looking. But here's what matters. Look at it, verse 18. And the Lord is with him. And the Lord is with him. Again, I want to encourage you in this. If the Lord's with you, you have nothing to fear. I, I quoted this earlier to one of the ladies in the back. Uh, Psalm 55, verse 22. It says, cast your burden upon the Lord. Cast your burden upon the Lord, it says, and He shall sustain thee. You know, to sustain you, that means He's going to provide. He's going to take care of business. You don't have to worry about the nitty-gritty, the details, the logistics. Hey, what's going to happen? I don't know, but I trust God to get us through it. Where are we going to go? What are the details? What are the specifics? Sometimes we just got to let go, cast our burden on the Lord and say, He shall sustain us. And he goes on, he says, He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. I want to, for a moment, I want to talk about the heart of David. Uh, again, if you look at the end of verse 7, it says, The Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Verse 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Verse 18, the last thing that was said, And the Lord is with him. This is his reputation. Uh, if you would go to Acts chapter 13. Go to Acts chapter 13, find verse number 22. I want you to see this, uh, the account, the testimony that we see of David. There are many characteristics of David. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll keep it short. David was known as being humble. David was known as being somebody that was willing to acknowledge his mistakes. When it was, thou art the man, and he knew he was in trouble, he said, yes, I, I failed. I'm sorry, I've sinned, Lord, right? Uh, in, in 1 Samuel 24, and also 2 Samuel 24, it says that David's heart smote him. He cut off Saul's skirt and it says his heart smote him. He numbered the people and his heart smote him. He was a man that was quick to repent and say, you know what, Lord? I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Let me be humble. Let me acknowledge where I've gone wrong and redirect it. Let me get my path back on the right direction. That was one of the greatest things, I believe, because he was tender-hearted with the Lord. I think that's one of the main things that God looks for in us. A contrite spirit. In Psalm 138, he said... I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Are you praising the Lord with all of your heart? I, I know, you know, sometimes I don't know this song. I don't want to sing today. You know, those kids up there, they're doing it with their whole heart because they don't know any better. Us adults, we get a little older and it's like, well, I'm not the talented one. They're talented. Let them sing. Uh, my voice is not a voice for singing. I, we, we were studying, we were talking about this, and I, 
I, I've been, uh, you know, working on leading music and, and composing, you know, just trying to get my mind wrapped around it. And I've discovered that the Lord has given me the talent for preaching, but not singing. But I'm going to do it anyway. And if you sit next to me, I'm sorry. My, I, don't, I can't carry a tune or a rhythm or a beat, but God's given us people that are talented in that. Uh, and I believe that I just have to sing with my whole heart. That I, I, does, it say make a, does it say make a beautiful noise? Joyful noise. He says, make a joyful noise. Well, that's what we ought to do. When we sing to the Lord, we're not singing to be seen of men. We're singing to the Lord and we're reading the words of these hymns that have great doctrine that can teach us where we've come from and where we're going. So sing with your whole heart. In Acts, you're in Acts 13, find verse 22. When he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, look at it, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. You know, one of the greatest characteristics, I mean, we see being humble and being loving and giving our whole heart and praising the Lord, but the testimony in the New Testament is that David would fulfill all my will. You remember Saul only did half. Then he threw in the towel. He rebelled. He did it his way. If you want to have a heart like David, if you will dare to be a David, will you fulfill all of God's will in your life? I believe that God has a great calling for every one of you somehow. And you're different than me just as a big puzzle piece You're shaped different than me and you look different than me and that's how God works when He sees the big picture and you don't have to look like me and sound like me and cut your hair like me and dress like me. You can come to to church in shorts and flip-flops and I'm not going to throw you out. But you have a place and a purpose that God wants you and most people will not fulfill God's will in their life. They're like part-time Christians. If we would get back to this and understand, if we're, if we're going to dare to be a David, that we have to search for all of God's will and then do the hard things. Hey, being saved is easy. Jesus did all the hard work. But living as a Christian really is hard work to maintain your testimony. And he says, hey, do the hard work. I'll help you. If you would go back to 1 Samuel. Go back to 1 Samuel. This time... We'll look at the next chapter. We'll look at uh, chapter 17. We're just going to glance at it as I show you the characteristics of the heart of David. Dare to be a David. Dare to have a heart just like David. Yeah, well, well, what did that look like? Of course, this is where we see the famous story of Goliath, right? Uh, And look at verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. That's the majority. The man of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and he will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David hears this promise. Hey, he'll make your house free, and he's going to give you uh, the king's daughter. David hears all this. So Wait, wait, wait. Say that again. You've got to kill the giant to do what? Like, Look at verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David came with great confidence. He's sitting at home watching the sheep. He's already got confidence that God's given him the victory. He shows up. They're all sitting around with nothing to do. Here comes the giant again, scaring them, taunting them, cursing them. And oh, what are we going to do? David's like, wait, wait, wait. What's, what's going to happen? Well, how dare this guy stand up and speak against God? Right. We ought to have that attitude to be yeah. bold and defend the Word of God. People are going to say things about you. They're going to make fun of you. Oh, you're one of those Christians, are you? We ought to, hey, amen, I am. Yeah, I'm a Bible thumper. i got a real big one because I can't see. You know? <laughs> amen. I'm not ashamed of the, of the Gospel. I'm not ashamed of the Word of God. I'm not ashamed of my church. I'm not ashamed of fellow Christians. Although... We often, we're all still humans and we do things shame worthy. All of us do. The question is, will we repent and give God the glory? Look at verse um, 29. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? 
His brothers say, oh, you go home. You're being silly. And he's like, no, there's a reason. There's a cause. You know what they call somebody that would die for a cause? They call him a crusader. And I'm not talking about the Catholic crusade. But I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you that we are more than conquerors. And we, there are causes on this earth that we need to stand for, that we need to fight for. Right? Hey, uh, abortion. Oh, uh, boy, that's offensive. We, I make uh, bumper stickers and give them away. Protected by eternal security. Uh, Jesus is God. I, I got, uh, God created male and female. Now, that's an offensive bumper sticker. But you know what? Is there not a cause? Isn't there a time and a reason and a place somebody should stand up with boldness and say, I'm not afraid of the Word of God. This is what the world needs to hear. This is the only truth. This is the only thing that can save them. Is there not a cause? They're mocking him. Look at verse 32. And David said unto Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now this is neat. David's the kid, and he says, Don't let your heart be afraid because of this giant. You know what David was? David was an encourager. You don't believe me. The next time you're having a hard time, you get in the book of Psalms, and you look at how those that David loved were trying to kill him, saying all sorts of crazy things about him, and he was praying for them. I, I want you to dare to be a David, to dare to have a heart to where I can come up and say, Lord, they've offended me, they've hurt me, they're attacking me. Would you bless them? Would you bless them? Would you help them? Would you guide them? Would you protect them? You know, in the New Testament, we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, right? We see Stephen. Lay not this sin to their charge. Paul had that same spirit. Will you dare to be a David? And have the heart of a David? Real quick and we'll be done. Look at verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. David was 100% fearless. You know what's interesting when you look at the details? Not only did Goliath have a sword and a spear and a shield, he had another man that ran before him with the same armor. Now, David, he was told, do it the way we've always done it. Try on my armor. He says, I've not proved this. This, this doesn't work for me. I'm different. I go with the Lord. The Lord is my armor. The Lord is my shield. The Lord is my buckler. I don't need your armor when God is with me. And it's amazing how the scientific facts of this, it's like, well, that'd be physically impossible. You need a missile to get through and kill that guy. And it's like, nope, one little stone. And it wasn't even the stone, was it? It was faith. It was faith. David's heart, was, so, was he was so courageous because the Lord was with him. He had such confidence in the Lord. He could have went barehanded just like he did with the lion. I think there's symbology to the stones. We'll talk about that next week. Look at verse 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hands, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. This little boy comes to the big guy that's scaring everybody, and he says, I'm going to cut off your head and all of your armies the wild animals are going to eat your bodies. Why? Look at it. He says at the end of verse 46, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You know, David's heart was this. Whatever I do, i got to make sure that everybody I come across, that they know that there is a God in this earth. And He's with us. And I want everybody to know there is a God in Jacksonville, Florida. And He alone saves. And He alone delivers. And we'll go with Him. We don't have to worry about lions and tigers and bears and giants and 10,000 armies if we will just put our confidence in the Lord. Amen. One of the most beautiful things about David's heart was he, he loved the Lord so much and he believed every word that he read. He penned so many songs. But his faith 
was in God for everything. Will you dare to be a David? Will you dare to have the faith of David when it's time for you to take that blind step and say, well, Lord, I'm going to cast my burden upon you because you promised you'll sustain me. I believe that. I know you'll provide. Do you believe that? Will you dare to be a David? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this lesson that we're learning tonight out of 1 Samuel. Lord, I thank you for this awesome example. Lord, I pray that you would use the Scriptures and your Holy Spirit to prick our heart and to show us the areas of our life that we need to get closer to you. Lord, I pray that these words would sink down and that we would draw to You and we would live for You and that we would take the Gospel outside of these doors and we would reach into this community. Lord, I ask that You would give us the opportunity to save souls in this neighborhood and see families restored. And uh, Lord, I just pray that people would know that there is a God in Jacksonville, Florida. And I pray that You would get all the glory. Lord, I pray that You would strengthen our heart to honor You and praise You with our whole heart and to give You the glory for all that You do. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.